All right. So, um, well, before the Dutch came to Taiwan, Taiwan was actually inhabited already for around 30,000 years by the island's Aboriginal people. Um, they would trade with the outsiders, but no one really knew much about the island in general, and not even like the, the Chinese Empire at the time knew much about the island. Um, then until 1544, these Portuguese seafarers passed by Taiwan, and they were um, so struck by like the beauty of the island, and then called it Formosa, which means beautiful island in Portuguese. So that's how the name Formosa came to be. Um, and then 16, in 1624, the Dutch East India Company founded a small colony on Taiwan's southwest coast. Um, today, it's known as uh, Ta Tainan, and uh, they called it Taijuan, which evolved into the Mandarin term for Taiwan. And so when the Dutch arrived in Taiwan, they built their first fort in Anping called Fort Zealandia, which is also known as Umping Old Fort. And this fort served as like the administrative center for the Dutch, as well as the center hub of trading. Um, that picture over there is a picture of what the fort looks like today. Um, mainly it serves as like a tourist center. Um, but yeah, the buildings inside the, inside the fort were modified over time by the Qing Dynasty and the Japanese after the Dutch. Um, yeah, some of the items that the Dutch would trade would be sugar, rice, pepper, silk, satin, porcelain, pepper, nutmeg, cinnamon. Uh, yeah, so they found their colonization in Taiwan to be highly profitable, but they definitely weren't safe from the indigenous Taiwanese and Chinese attacks. Um, nor from their trade rivals who were Spain and Japan. And so they realized in order to stay safe, they had to uh, exert control over the island. And so to do this, they would, um, for example, pacify the Plains people, import Chinese labor, and um, attempt to destroy their, their rival Spain. Um, so because of these actions, the Dutch continued to be highly profitable, profitable, but not for long. Um, that's when the military leader, um, Zhen Chenggong, also known as Ko Koshinga, came to Taiwan in 1644, who I'll talk about in the next slide. Yeah, so Koshinga was an ardent supporter of the China's Ming Dynasty. And after the last Ming emperor was overthrown by uh, Manchu warriors in 1644, he gathered Ming loyalists and launched a campaign to oust the Qing dynasty, um, which was the, the, the dynasty that, that took over the Ming. Um, however, he wasn't very successful and he was pushed southward after many defeats. And by 1660, Koshinga was thinking of Taiwan as a good place where he and his loyalists could regroup. So then in the following year, he lands in Taiwan and surrounds Fort Zealandia and Fort Provincia, which is another fort the Dutch built, uh, which took the Dutch by surprise. And so the Dutch couldn't hold out much longer from uh, Koshinga's forces. And they suffered disease and hunger that eventually caused him to surrender to Koshinga in early 1662. And with this surrender, the Dutch were not only able to sail to the company's headquarters in what is now known as Indonesia. Um, but despite all of this, Koshinga didn't enjoy his victory for very long. Um, before his death, he changed the name of Taijo Wan to Anping and he also created the kingdom of Dongning. Um, and then he died of malaria, but his kingdom lasted 21 years um, until the Qing forces attacked them in 1683. And Koshinga's grandson quickly surrendered to these forces. And then the island then became part of the Chinese empire.
Sorry, guys. For some reason, Presby's not letting me click like the space bar to go to my next slide or something. Just use the arrow button. Yeah, but the arrow button, like, I it's not like letting me like access it at some points. Okay. Yeah. So, the discussion question I have is. What kind of legacy did the Dutch leave for Taiwan? And yeah, feel free to unmute um, you, your mics if you would like to discuss this question. Um, so the year 1683 is when the um, Qing Dynasty took over Taiwan. Um, so I actually just started off with the Battle of Penghu, where um, the Amaro Shi Long from the Qing Dynasty attacked Yongming, which is um, in Penghu. Um, but in the end, Amaro Shi Long actually won with um, outnumbered forces. And after that, um, Taiwan was officially annexed and became part of the Chinese empire. And as soon as Taiwan um, became part of the Chinese empire, um, there were like policies that were set by, the, by them. Um, so like here, the first policy was regarding um, like restrictions for the number of immigrants to um, travel from China, mainly China, China to Taiwan. Um, however, like a lot of the peasants near Fujian, um, they wanted to like so like even under like restrictions, they still wanted to uh, migrate to a uh, Taiwan to find like better lives. Um, the second policy was about. Um, restriction for the Han Chinese to like entering the mountain area, which is like the usually like the east coast of Taiwan, and it's usually like occupied by the um, indigenous Taiwanese. And the third policy was about um, the Chinese Empire applying like different tax rates for the Han immigrants and Aboriginals. So this kind of shows just how like there's like different groups of people living in Taiwan or like immigrating to Taiwan and but they they're like all under now like um all under the Chinese Empire's government and the picture is um yeah it's just a picture for the battle of Penghu between Admiral Xinlong and when they were like attacking Dongming. Um, so now like talking about like 18th century Taiwan. So there's like um, big cities that start to emerge. Um, so three, um, I guess like the three largest cities that uh, emerging the 18th century were Xinzu, Taipei, and Jiayi. So um, this time, like the, um, it's not like under Japanese occupation yet, but Xinzu actually became a um, more like important military base. And there's actually like a, um, it's called like in the Xinzu city, it's called um, I don't know how to say it in English, but it's called like Dongmenchen, and you, you can actually see that just like in Xinzu, it's like in front of a train station, there's just like the military base there. Um, and in Taipei, um, there are like mostly indigenous people before the um, Han people immigrated to Taiwan. Um, and also in 1884, the um, Qing moved the capital to Taipei. 
and for Tai, it's mainly for like a center of trade and communication. And later on, there is also the um, town and like irrigation system that's built. Um, and next, regarding like the government and the judicial system in Taiwan during the 18th century, it was extremely corrupt because there's just like different groups of people living there immigrants aboriginals and they were like fight for land water and there's like um some like crimes as well um and then regarding um there's also after the immigrants um from china moved to like taiwan um, there's like intermarriage between the Fujianese Hak and Hakaman with the Aboriginal women. And this can um, be explained as like involving some like political or just like diplomatic relationships because um, with like the policies or like restrictions, it's easier for like the immigrants to stay. And this is like more beneficial for those immigrants to um, have intermarriage with the Aboriginal women. And so now we're gonna talk about the important temples during this um, time. Um, so like temples are usually just like for worship and offerings to um to gods and um the Tain the Tainan um grand Matsu temple was actually the first um Matsu temple and it's in Tainan. Um in 1720 it was a first uh constructed by the Kanji Emperor at uh, Prince Ningjing's palace and on Saino Prince Ningjing is um, he was the last prince of the Ming Dynasty who like later on like came to Taiwan and then settled. Um, and so like regarding the Matsu Temple in Tainan, so Matsu is actually is also known as the Matsu Sea God. So it's to like it's a god that serves to like protect fishermen who are like. Um, out on the seas at night and um, later on this like Matsu temple also became like a protection for Taiwan and here on the this picture is like a is the Tainan um, Matsu temple All right. Can you guys hear me? Okay. You might have to speak um, up a little bit. You're a little bit quieter. All right. So this next period is Taiwan under Japanese rule, which begins with the Treaty of Shimonoseki, and which was signed after the first Sino-Japanese War in 19, or sorry, 1895, when the Chinese lost to the Japanese. And in this treaty, the Qing Dynasty of China ceded sovereignty of Taiwan to the Japanese Empire, which then went on to rule Taiwan until the end of the World War II in 1945. So we're going to talk a little bit about the Taiwanese infrastructure development during this period, which actually happened very quickly. So, for example, many schools were established across the island. For example, um, National Taiwan University, as it's known today, was originally called Taihoku Imperial University, and attendance was limited only to Japanese nationals, which was a similar trend in schools around Taiwan that were founded by the Japanese Empire. And additionally, the Bank of Taiwan, one of today's largest Taiwanese banks, was established in 1899 as a way to encourage financial groups from Japan to invest in Taiwan's development. And also 
Taiwan's railroad system was started during this period, along with access to electric power from the Sun Moon Lake. And with more dams and irrigation systems, the crop yield and raw material exports from Taiwan increased, eventually leading to in 1905 when Taiwan's economy became self-sufficient and was weaned off of Japanese subsidies. Uh, of course, not everyone was happy about this Japanese rule. For example, in 1907, we saw armed dissent in the form of the Beipu Uprising, which was led by two groups, uh, the Hakka and Saisia people of northern Taiwan. Uh, under Japanese rule, ethnically Han Chinese individuals were seen as second-class citizens, but Taiwanese aboriginals were seen as savages and barbarians. The original intent of this rebellion was to protect family against Japanese forces. Uh, but as a result of this, 57 Japanese individuals were killed and over 100 Taiwanese individuals were killed in retaliation, mostly in brutal fashion. Uh, this set the tone for future rebellions against Japanese rule in Taiwan. Um, so in the last few months of 1930, specifically from October to December 1930, fighting between Japanese soldiers and a group of aboriginals uh, was raging in central Taiwan. Led by Mona Rudal, a Cedic aboriginal tribes leader, this incident came to, known, came to be known as the Usa incident, also known as the Musa uprising. Uh, the Usa incident was the last major aboriginal revolt against the Japanese during the Japanese occupation of Taiwan. Um, this revolt was in no means just like a spontaneous act of rebellion, but was more like a ticking time bomb. The Japanese, while in Japan, heavily discriminated against the Taiwanese population, especially with the aboriginals. Aboriginals were referred to as savages, especially the mountainous aboriginals that had not integrated into society in the cities. Um, the term cooked and raw savages were even used by the Japanese to represent civilized aboriginals compared to non-civilized aboriginals. The Cedic tribe, among many other aboriginals, uh, mountain tribes were subjected to Japanese rule. Um, they were forced to do manual labor and were often relocated to make way for Japan's logging industry. Their hunting grounds were also taken away from them and their culture, were, culture was often looked down upon by the Japanese. These behaviors eventually led to this Usa incident which occurred at the town of Usa on sports day. Um, during this day the whole town usually comes together to watch their children compete in sports um, among each other and was a perfect opportunity for the Cedic tribe to massacre the Japanese as everyone attended sports day. Um, in the end, the Japanese were able to successfully wipe out the resistance, although there were casualties. Records indicate there were around 130 Japanese officers and civilians that were killed, while around 600 Cedic people were killed, although there have been indications that after the Cedic tribe surrendered, the Japanese would allow other tribes to kill them or bully them. Um, However, the Japanese had to resort to the use of advanced weaponry against the Cedic tribe who used only guns and knives. This included resorting to chemical warfare, which violated the international law noted in the Geneva Protocol. Um, also, they used planes and even partnered with enemy tribes because of the way um, the Cedic fought, which was using guerrilla warfare style, um, something very unique that the Japanese um, did not have experience in. Moreover, it was a stark reminder that uh, resistance against Japanese occupation was not completely suppressed and that the Japanese had to review their Aboriginal policies after this incident. Uh, on the right, the black and white photo is the uh, Mona Rudal, who was the leader of the Cedic tribe that initiated this incident. Um, Director Wade Sun, upon seeing this image uh, and rediscovering the intricate details of the story, decided it was his job to bring this to the big screens. And that's how the movie Cedic Bail came to be. Um, a scene from the movie is shown in the bottom right picture, bottom picture. Um, the right top picture is the traditional facial tattooing of the Cedic tribe and also uh, traditional clothing. Um, so now we're gonna watch two clips that are based on true stories. Uh, the first is from Cedic Bale, 2011 film of the Usa incident. And note that the languages in the film include Japanese and the Cedic language. Um, I've seen the film before and highly recommend it because it portrays this incident with great detail to historical accuracy, great casting, great screenwriting, and doesn't portray all the Japanese as cruel and terrible 
um, like other films. The second is a trailer for Kano, which is a 2014 film about a baseball team unlike any other baseball teams beforehand that consisted of uh, Japanese, Han Taiwanese, and Taiwanese Aboriginals uh, and their journey to representing Taiwan as the baseball champion uh, ships held in Japan at Koshien. The film is also written by uh, director Wei De Sun and like Cedric Bale, this film also received many awards and both films are in the top five highest domestic grossing films in Taiwan to this day. So I would highly recommend both videos and if you like Kano especially, it's on YouTube for free now with ads. <laughs> Let me know if you guys can hear, hear this and unmute my mic. We cannot hear it. Okay, I cannot hear. Enough. You have to share the audio separately. Yeah. Okay, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> um, go back to your share. If you go back to share screen at the bottom, there will be a tab and just like a, like a specific check mark that you have to. Computer sound. No? I see a speaker. Try again. Okay. Here you go. ここ
放棄に参加したのは6つのブラック約300人の戦士です戦士君はこの野蛮人どもを改革しすぎじゃないかねロナルドは何度スパッツするとすぐに消えるまるで亡霊のような存在です強力な武器を備えた数千人の武装部隊がたった300人余りの定番の獲物にされて金入れぞ中福山バヤコ中福山バヤコ يتداقي نقصوا الكيلو تناسون يتداقي السيد قبضة. So the next film is Kano. ここ半人半人、日本人の混成チーム<笑>いいですか。半人は足が速い。半人は打撃が強い。日本人は守備に長けている。こんな理想的なチームはどこにもない。野球のことは、主人も自分なりの考えがあってのことですし。男なら、堂々としなさい。負けたものに泣くしかくはない。負けたものに泣くしかくはない。負けたものに泣くしかくはない。負けたものに泣くしかくはない。負けたものに泣くしかくはない。負けたものに泣くしかくはない。負けたものに泣くしかくはない。負け
Um, also, there's one more thing if you didn't catch, these two events occurred a year apart from each other, showing that like Japanese occupation and resistance varied significantly between different areas of Taiwan. Um, so Japanese occupation of Taiwan lasted from 1895 to 1945. Due to Japan losing World War II, they had to give up Taiwan because it was a formal co colony. Um, the start of all these conflicts was in 1937 with the Second Sino-Japanese War between the Japanese Empire and the Republic of China, which is just like mainland China now. Um, this fighting eventually encompassed World War II and often not mentioned in textbooks was that the Japanese actually had Taiwanese soldiers in their armies. Um, it started in 1936 when the aboriginals were first able to enter and then in 1942 to 43 uh, the Han Taiwanese. By 1944 the Taiwanese shared the same status as Japanese soldiers. Um, aboriginals were first recruited because Japan was suffering huge losses to disease in the tropics um, and since aboriginals have lived in these environments for generations the Japanese thought it would be a good a great idea because they probably would be able to withstand these uh, diseases and other stressors, including heat. Um, during World War II, as Taiwan was a colony under Japan, the Allied forces bombed multiple cities in Taiwan, including Jiayi, Taipei, and Kaohsiung. Um, the left image was taken by US aircrafts after bombing uh, Taipei, um, the capital of Taiwan now. Uh, by 1945, the Japanese empire was dismantled and had to give up Taiwan. Taiwan was um, then under the control of the Republic of China. Japanese people in Taiwan, even those with family in Taiwan and those that were born and raised in Taiwan and had never seen Japan were forced to move back to Japan. All right, next slide. So yeah, um, just another discussion question. So what cultural slash physical traces of Japanese occupation can still be seen in Taiwanese society today? Um, you can put it in the chat or just speak out. There are a lot of instances. I'm sure you can find just like one. Anime is not one of them. So please do not list that. <laughs> So yeah, we mentioned baseball and then, so that's why um, the director wanted to show Kano because like that was a starting point with like the pride of like baseball in Taiwan. Um, also um, cool fact, but like rice used to be indica rice um, and this kind of rice was uh, like Taiwan's primary rice source. Uh, indica, indica rice is from, indica rice um, now um, only like Southeastern Asians eat so like we would have been eating the same rice as like um, people in India or like Philippines, like those kind of areas. But because um, ja Japan wanted, Japan occupied Taiwan, and then they also wanted to use Taiwan as a place to grow rice to send back to Japan, they switched to uh, Japonica. And since, now, since then, Taiwan now eats like more like East Asian types of rice. So that's a Japonica one that um, China, Korea, and Japan eat. Um, so that's a big difference. Um, irrigation systems. Uh, that's also another th thing that Japan did. Um, if you watch Kano, you can also see that um, Kano mentions one of the irrigation systems that um, Japan built, and it's like a side story to the baseball team. So that's also pretty interesting. Public health, um, as in like sewage and water reservoirs, that was also initiated by Japan. Um, also with education, um, like NTU, like specific universities in Taipei, that's uh, those were like leftover from Japan. Um, we mentioned architecture before um, in Taipei. So I guess like the most like famous one that's like still standing would be um, the presidential palace, which is the bottom picture. Um, as you can see, it's um, more of like a European slash like Japanese type of architecture just because Japan at that time, um, yeah, Japan at that time uh, wanted to diffuse these kind of things. Um, railroads, um, there were initially railroads before Japan came in, but Japan de definitely like expanded it out. And then, so those were built upon and now are high-speed rail in Taiwan. And then also urban planning, just like city planning, and also the legal system that Japan brought over. Um, the picture, so the top, uh, the top picture is the original Kano team. It's an old photograph of the team that actually went to Japan. 
And then the middle photo is just like, um, it's just a baseball team in Taiwan right now. Just that a very important sport in Taiwan. So yeah. <laughs> What's the bottom photo? Tiffany. <laughs> Uh, the presidential palace it's in taipei you can i think you can go in i've never been into it um i've seen it but that's about it it's really big so if you're ever in taipei you can go visit it Alrighty. so i know a lot of you guys know how um taiwan was kind of like occupied by like some chinese individuals who kind of like escaped from China but um, my presentation is going to kind of go over um, the main events that occurred in China that led to them leaving China. So the first one is going to be the double 10 day and it occurred on October um, 10, 1990, um, 1911. It's actually a national holiday celebrated on October 10th every year. It kind of like marks the anniversary of the Wuchang uprising and a revolt that led to the declaration of independence from the central Qing government back in China. Um, this uprising originated from like the growing disapproval of the Qing government um, due to their you know corruption and they were like very submissive to Western powers because they wanted to like you know kind of kiss up to them. Um, so revolutionary groups start to form in Wuhan, China. Um, and led to a series of revolts against the Qing dynasty. Um, and this kind of indicated the start of what is the Xinhai Revolution. And on October 10, 1911, the revolutionists successfully overthrew the Qing Empire and the government, and this marked the end of the dynasty, um, the dynasty rule over China. And then on January 1st, 1912, Dr. Sun Yat-sen, um, a Chinese doctor, he's also a revolutionary and political leader. He became the first president of the Republic of China, or ROC, under the rule of the Nationalist Party, KMT. So he's kind of like the main guy you think of uh, when it comes to like the KMT. Um, and the ROC remained a sovereign state based in the mainland China until the 1945, a little after the end of the World War II with Japan, until its relocation of the government and the millions of refugees to the island of Taiwan. Um, a little fun fact, um, the current Taiwan flag actually has design elements of the ROC flag. So the blue sky and the white sun is like, if you look on the picture I posted there, you can see like the blue portion, there's like the white sun. So the, there's a blue sky and a white sun. Um, and this was kind of like the Nationalist Party. Um, and then Dr. Sun actually edited the red portion of the flag. Oh yeah, I forgot to explain my photo. But yes, um, this is like a huge event. Um, it's held every year in Taiwan, but you can also see it in major cities in the US such as New York City, which is I believe where this was held, this picture was held in. So um, in China, there are many political parties that form. The main ones are the KMT and the CP, um, CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. Um, from 1912 to 1921, there are uh, many political parties that are formed in China. Um, the important one is August um, 12, the Nationalist Party, or um, Kuomintang, was established in Peking, and Dr. Sun was the chosen party chairman. Um, there's another really important individual called Yang Shikai, and he was like a military government official. He kind of like grew in power, and he really started to ignore like people's opinions and like the parlance um in making presidential decisions um and it was even suspected that um one of the nationalist party's uh, most influential member um was apparently uh, assassinated and they believed that um ren was behind this plot so the nationalist party like who suspected ren tried to overthrow him and started an uprising but unfortunately it failed and so what happened was ren with all this power he expelled that um, he expelled these um, influential people from the KMT from the parliament, and he dissolved the Nationalist Party by November. So what ended up happening was most of these individuals fled from into exile to Japan. And here, Dr. Sun has to, um, tried to establish the um, Chinese Revolutionary Party, um, but many of his old um, revolutionary comrades kind of like ref refused to join or support his efforts because it just kept on like leading to failure and like you know 
a lot of violence. Um, but eventually, he, um, Dr. Sun did succeed, and he res resurrected the KMT on October 10, 1919, in Shanghai, under the name Kuomintang of China. And then on July 1921, this is when the Chinese Communist Party was officially founded. And it was founded under the influence of Marxism, mainly from the Soviet Union. Um, so actually, it was, this is actually kind of like surprising to me when I read about this, but apparently Mao Zedong and early members of the CCP joined the KMT in 1923 under the encouragement of the Soviet Union. So they actually did collaborate at some point. And um, the KMT actually really grew in power under um, another um, leader who took after Dr. Song Chang leadership. But the CCP was also increasing numbers secretly by recruiting new members like behind the KMT's back. And then during World War II, this is kind of when they um, fell out, both the KMT and the CCP. They were supposed to unite together to um, fight against the Japanese, but you know, tensions grew um, because they were kind of like not supporting each other um, during the Japanese attacks because so they started like, you know, hating on each other. Um, and that's kind of like what led to their eventual fallout during the World War II. And Erica was, um, well, kind of, no, was it, no, Mia will kind of discuss the civil war that kind of erupted between the um, communists and nationalists um, later on after this presentation slide. And this is what eventually led to the defeat of the nationalists. So this is actually a really big event and it's like very like, you know, memorial one in Taiwan is the 228 um, incident. This is because this incident occurred on February 28th in 1947. So essentially what happened is um, after World War II um, and the constant fighting with the CCP, um, the KMT was really weak um, and they, um, they were able to occupy Taiwan because Japan surrendered Taiwan back to them. Um, so the KMT officials in the military in Taiwan kind of like mismanaged Taiwan by you know, monopolizing all the industries and they were just very corrupt. Um, and then the native Taiwanese people um, were really looking forward to the, you know, the, the reunification of the mainland after you know, many years under Japanese colonization, but this obviously didn't happen because in, on February 27, 1947, um, it was like at a tobacco monopoly bureau and there was like a widowed like, cigarette peddler in Taiwan and they were fighting with some of the enforcers and then the crowds kind of formed and arguments followed and what occurred was there was a shooting and then one Taiwanese person dropped dead and then the following day on the 28th um, a lot of people gathered around the um sorry I'm trying to find the building I wrote down um around the KMT building as you can see in the bottom right picture you can see like all the crowds form around this tobacco building there um they're prote um, protesting their treatment and they were met with like machine gun fire and that's what led to the massacre of many Taiwanese citizens. And so the whole island revolted and many local Taiwanese um, citizens wrestled for control. And eventually they did. But what happened following this incident was the backlash from the KMT and what followed was the white terror, basically a massive suppression, murder, and imprisonment of the political descendants or anyone who just, you know, the KMT perceived as threat to them. And then I think I have a, a video down there. Doot, doot, doot. Um, this is actually a movie that kind of like um, shows the 228 incident really well. And it was actually one of the best movies in Taiwan as well. Separated by war, haunted by violence, pursued by government. 
watch as the Lin family struggles through Taiwan's dramatic social change. Survival is at stake. Just want to give you a few more details about this video because I poorly described it, but it was actually the first Taiwanese film to achieve a major, a major international prize, and it was actually the first film to actually broach the subject of like a traumatic experience in a um, nation's history. Um, so like it's a very complex film, and it won a lot of um, accolades for even addressing this kind of like traumatic incidents very well. It's actually free on YouTube if you search up, I forgot the name already, A City of Sadness. But it's free on YouTube. You can watch the whole video with English subs. Just had a discussion question. Um, how did the 228 incident eventually lead to the Taiwanese independence movement? Okay, uh, give me just a second to back up the full screen okay yes yes so first this um led to 1949 what was considered called the great retreat where with the the commun the china's communist revolution and then the ccp were, were kind of taking over the mainland so the kmt was ousted the republic of china was ousted and they fled to taiwan and so this was kind of followed by, in the same two, three year time span, about like two million Chinese refugees also fleeing the new power, the new mainland power to Taiwan as well, which obviously it's a large number of people for a pretty small area. And so it greatly transformed the dynamic and the balance of cultures and ethnic groups in Taiwan. And then so this led to like a pretty, a much greater distinction between the two groups. I'm, Sorry in advance if any of my pronunciation is really bad. I can't really speak Chinese. But so um, the Wai Shangrang versus the Lan Shangrang, which refer to the what they consider the mainlanders versus the Aboriginal and the more indigenous Taiwanese natives. And so it led to a greater imbalance of this and, and the mainland Chinese people kind of coming and taking over like their land, their culture, and everything. Part of this and the KMT rule in Taiwan was the introduction of uh, different sinicization programs where the KMT was still trying to promote the idea that the KMT occupied Taiwan was the real China still, and the Republic of China was still the real China and not CCP. Um, and so they did this by like, reasserting the Chinese identity to the different people in Taiwan. So this included any remnants kind of like of Japanese identity left over from their occupation or towards the natives and promoting Mandarin Chinese and their culture over the different indigenous heritages. And then following, kind of starting before the CCP really took over and then leading on later on was the period called the White Terror. And so this period of where martial law was implemented is act was actually until the Syrian martial law ended in 2011 was considered the longest time period of martial law being implemented ever. Um, the Syrian one was 48 years, I believe, but this one was 40 years, which is still a very, very long time. And kind of like Tiffany got into, this occurred kind of after 228 and consisted of 
um, people not being allowed to have their own political parties or free speech or allowed freedom of expression or anything that could be considered a threat to KMT's rule or anything that could be considered sympathizing towards CCP. And then anybody who was so was punished oftentimes without trial. And then so this included many different Taiwanese independence groups and other mainland Chinese people who had fled to Taiwan. And I think I believe it was something like 140,000 people arrested and three or 4,000 people killed or executed during this time. Um, for a long period of time during martial law, nobody was allowed to talk about the 2 incident or anything else. And there was no actual public apology or memorial or anything until 1995 under President Lee. And then I believe the current president uh, last year did do something for the 70th anniversary, but still, yeah. And then, so this picture here is actually a poster from a Netflix show, from a show that's on Netflix, A Touch of Green. It was released in 2015. It was a Taiwanese period kind of drama series that consisted of 31 episodes. And it followed a group of Republic of Chinese Air Force pilots and their wives during the Chinese Communist Revolution and in the White Terror period afterwards, starting from the end of the Japanese rule to 1981. Um, if anyone is interested in it, I do highly suggest watching it. It won six awards at the 2016 Golden Bell Awards and is a series of a television show. So my peers at all have been sitting down for like three hours and watching Kano, even though I also highly recommend watching that. Yeah, and then next slide, please. Yeah, and then so kind of following the period, um, still during martial law and then towards the end of it was when the kind of real the idea of the real representation of China kind of shifted. So post World War II, the Republic of China, the KMT based government in Taiwan was still largely acknowledged as China internationally. But over time as mainland China's presence kind of grew stronger and then like the CCP was backing the other communist countries and like the Korea and Vietnam Wars and stuff like that the balance kind of shifted as mainland China gained more political and like economic power and everything. And so this really kind of came to a head in 1971 when the United Nations passed their General Assembly resolution that replaced Taiwan's Republic of China seat with the CCP's People's Republic of China. And so this was a big deal because Taiwan just lost a lot of international recognition and power and then quickly following after that led to them losing any sort of representation in the UN, in the World Health Organization, in IMF, or in the, even in the Olympics, which if anybody remembers from the past few, Taiwan's only been allowed to participate under the name of Chinese Taipei with a modified flag and then no anthem. So they're not actually able to represent themselves as Taiwan, but as something else. And this is still something that's kind of going on today. And then so, as you can also see in this picture here, this is a picture from uh, President Nixon's visit to mainland China in 1972. He visited Taiwan, um, not Taiwan, he visited China and then around the same time also called for removal of any remaining US troops in Taiwan. And then also passed the Shanghai Communique where the US acknowledged the one China policy. So that essentially that China and Taiwan were all one China under the CCP, under the People's Republic of China. Um, a lot of this is still really significant now because we're still seeing evidence of these shifts today because the, Taiwan's still not like officially recognized by the UN. Um, and even with like modern day like COVID stuff going on, I'm sure many of you have seen that talks about Taiwan has not been allowed to take part in any of the World Health Organization emergency meetings or anything else. They've been banned from all of that still because of the conflicts. Next slide, please. Yeah, and then so kind of getting into a road to democracy. So after the period of like the martial law ended, um, it was lifted in 1987 by, <laughs> how do I pronounce? Okay, give me a second to pronounce this. By Chiang Ching Kuo, so sorry, the son of Chiang Kai-shek. Um, in response to kind of pro-independence calls for political reform, a lot of which were coming with people who were in support of Dr. Sun's free people's principles. And then, so he also, during his period of rule, he recruited many nat native Taiwanese politicians to power, he was more democracy and kind of 
focusing less on the unification and then corrupt power from promoting and um, recruiting like mainland Chinese politicians and then focusing on native Taiwanese politicians. And then after his death, um, this led to the first direct presidential election in 1996. And so this election, the KMT's President uh, Ling Teng Hui, sorry, <laughs> he still won this election, but he did win with only 54% of votes, which isn't a huge amount, but you can see here in this photo on the left, that is him. And also he actually just died recently earlier this year, um, to put that into perspective. But after 1996, in the next election, was actually not won by the KMT, which was a really big deal because this ended a 50-year rule of KMT power in Taiwan and led to the first transfer of the Republic of China's government executive power between political parties and was relatively quite peaceful. And so the winner of this election was from the Democratic Progressive Party. Um, and then there was President Chen Shui-bian. Sorry, <laughs> again, but yeah. And then so he won this election and it was a relatively peaceful transition of power and led to, in 2007, the Democratic Progressive Party actually released a formal resolution that stated that they were breaking from the previously held belief that Taiwan was still China, and then the kind of the formation of their own national identity as Taiwan, as it became more economically and politically stable on its own. Um, currently, the current actual president of Taiwan is still a member of this DPP as well. Um, and then they currently hold uh, the presidential and the current legislative majority in their government. So that does say something about how the overall majority and political opinions has kind of switched. Um, can you go to the next slide? Just to make a small edit, the, uh, for President Li, Li Denghui, um, he's actually on the right photo. And then- oh, sorry, um, the about that. <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, with the times. Sorry about that, <laughs> that's my bad. Yeah, and then so kind of a discussion question, I kind of got into this a little bit and we kind of talked about this in Tiffany's question as well. But how did the period of martial law kind of lead to the start of modern day democracy and independence in Taiwan as we see it now? 